Call Me Francis Tuckett by Gary Paulson. Here we are, chapter 11, and then probably chapter 12. Lottie awakened early. Francis heard her as she broke small sticks and found red coals to blow on to make morning fire. They had all slept through the night without eating, and Francis decided it might have been the best thing possible for the meat stew he had prepared. It had cooked until the fire was out, and then he came in by the, came in by the fire, and when he came in by the fire, Lottie had pulled the pot over to the flames and warmed it. Francis lifted the lid, and the meat had become tender and fallen away from the bones. He let the two children eat. Lottie was quiet, and he thought it was because she wasn't fully awake yet, and then finished what they did not want and then finish what they did not want. That's what he did. He finished what they didn't want. All of it didn't take an hour. It was just getting light in the east when they packed the bedrolls and loaded the mare and the mule for the day. Francis helped them up on the mule, smiling at Bill as Billy turned around to sit backward and mounted the mare and rode away from the camp. The day went smoothly. Clouds held to the horizon and then vanished, and the sun was hot and welcomed. A small breeze kept the flies down, and Francis figured Lottie's talker must have played out because, other than ask a question now and then, she was mostly quiet. They quickly settled into the routine of riding, covering ground. Uh, covering ground. Francis had turned straight west, had given up on hitting tracks, but in the middle of the afternoon they came to a ridge that was impossible to climb that stretched far away to the south, and they had to turn north. Fifteen miles or so north, Francis could see the line of the ridge, and as they moved slowly in that direction, he could see dust near the end of the ridge. Lottie saw it as well as as well and told him about it. Dust up there, you see it? Reminds me of the time when we were crossing the river just just after we started before Paul uh he got his sick got the sickness. All the wagons had to wait in the same place so they corralled the stock until everybody was ready to ford the river and they raised such a cloud of dust. It's buffalo, Francis said squinting. I can see them. But he was wrong. Lottie was right, or partially so as they moved closer at a crawl, or so it fell to Francis, he could see the dust wasn't from Buffalo, but from moving wagons. It was a full train, but they weren't fording a river. When they were a mile off, he counted 12 wagons, and they were bunched at the bottom of a steep upgrade with the horses and oxen corralled in a rope enclosure. The stock milling around was making the dust. However the train was made up, uh, Whoever the train was made up of, he could travel with them, and somebody would take in the children. They were nearly a quarter of a mile from the wagons. Francis could see individuals with, uh, and hear the cracks of their whips as they worked the stock. When somebody from the wagon train noticed him, there was a sudden movement that Francis thought looked like ants scurrying when an anthill had been kicked, and four men came running from the wagons to meet him. They were all carrying rifles, and they stopped when Francis was still 150 yards away, stopped and stood four abreast with their rifles across their chests. They probably think we're Indians, Francis thought. Probably a mistake. I know those men, Lottie said suddenly in back of him. What? He turned, and the mare kept walking. That's the wagon train that drove us out when the sickness came. I know those men, those four men. That's Peterson and Elville and Johnson and McIntyre. And they were the ones to push us away and make us be where he, you found us and saved us. Francis turned back to the front. Pushing the sick ones out wasn't maybe nice, but it was the only thing they could do to save the rest. He understood that, but the sickness was past. Surely they wouldn't cause problems now. When they were 50 miles away, 50 yards away, the men leaned in together and spoke quickly amongst themselves when, then Francis, then faced Francis again. You can't come into the wagons, the man on the left said. Those children might be infected, and we had to send them out. Francis stopped the mare 25 yards. The one who spoke actually moved his rifle, so the barrel was on Francis, and he thought, This is crazy. I'm not trying to hurt them. They're all right now. It was their paw who took sick. These two are fine, and so am I. Just the same. We can't take the chance. We'll set some food and water out here for you, and you turn and head out on your own. The man spoke to one of the others who trotted back to the wagons and came back in a moment with a bucket of water and a loaf of bread. All this time, Francis sat holding the mare and the mule back. They had seen the stock and thought it was the, where they uh, would spend the night and were, an were anxious to end the day's ride. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. I'm not geared for children. They need to be with wagons, people. The man shook his head. I'm sorry, but we can't. We have other children to think of, and if they have the sickness and bring it back in, I'm taking a risk just standing here talking to you. 
It might blow on me and I could carry it back to the wagons. That's the same trash they talked when... That's the same trash they talked when they sent us off before, Lottie said suddenly. Just the same when Paul tried to get them to take us in and let him go off alone just to be sick. They wouldn't do it then, and they're talking the same trash now. You're just dirt, Frank McIntyre, just pig dirt, and you know it. Francis held his hand up to quiet Lottie and tried one more time. I can go off alone. In fact, I'd rather. I don't want to be with your train, or he thought, with any other train if they're all, all like this. But these two are too young. Just the same, McIntyre stopped him. We can't let you in. Ride on around if you like and pick up the trail. Say, stay a quarter mile out and Godspeed to you. There's a trading post three days west by a wagon. Maybe you can find help there, though I doubt it. When they find you're carrying the sickness, they won't let you come in. And if we push it, the man raised his rifle, as, as did the others. We'll do what we have to do. Shoot us. We'll do what we have to do, he repeated, and be sorry for it later. It was hopeless. Francis turned the mare to the side and began the long circle around, out around the train and back to the trail, the mule plodding behind. He did not take the food and he did not take the water and thought if he lived to be a hundred, he would never take anything from people, good or bad, again. Wow. It wasn't much of a trading post. In fact, it wasn't much of anything. They rode a full day in that in what looked to be permanent ruts. After they rode around the wagon train and the armed men followed them all around to make certain they kept going, Francis led the mule up the grade the wagons were trying to climb. It was too steep for a wagon and they were using 200 foot poles, ropes, 200 foot ropes and a triple team of horses on top of, on top to pull the wagons up one at a time. But the grade didn't bother the mare or the mule at all. And when they came out on top where there was a stony ledge, Francis was amazed to see that the trail was so used it cut into the stone itself. Grooves left the top of the ridge and headed west into the prairie. Grooves a foot deep in the hard sod and the grass was eaten down so much along the way that the ground had turned to dust. It almost made Francis smile. He'd been worried about losing the trail. He couldn't have lost this if he were blind. It was absolutely flat. Even the small rolling hills seemed to be flattened out, and the three days it would take would have taken a wagon to get to the post were only a day and a half on a mare and mule. They stopped for the night in a dry, fireless camp. There were no sprigs, springs and preceding wagons, and people had burned every available stick of dry wood or even dry buffalo manure so they couldn't build a fire. There was also no grass for the animals anywhere near the trail. Stock from wagon trains had eaten it down so low that even the roots were gone and the dirt, the earth was a dry, empty powder. Francis almost smiled that night, again thinking of his worry about finding the trail. Camp was a miserable affair. Dark and with no fire to cheer them, they ate the last of the venison jerky, both Lottie and Billy sneezing from the dust that seemed to fill the air. Even at night, when Francis slept fitfully because there was no way to conceal himself in case trouble came, it was like trying to sleep on the top of an immense dusty table. They were out of everything but water and flour in the morning, so they drank water, and each took a mouthful of raw flour, and they started before sun, sun up, the dust coming up from the hooves, clogging their noses and eyes, their nose and eyes. Francis tried swinging away from the main part of the trail, but many had already done it. Thousands, Jason Grimes had said they were coming from the east so thick it was like swarming bees, and the dust was everywhere, so he wrapped pieces of cut from the tarp around Lottie and Billy and just kept slogging. So he put them on as a mask over their face. The trading post came as a complete surprise. A small breeze had come up, making the dust worse, and Francis had been looking down to keep his eyes from filling when suddenly the mare stopped. He nudged her without looking up, but he, she didn't go, and when he looked up, he saw it was because she had, had her shoulders against the top rail of a fence. Actually, it was less a fence than a crude collection of broken wagon parts, tongues, boards from the sides, old wheels all lashed together to make a ramshackle corral. To the right was a gate made from a large rear wheel of a wagon, and over the gate a rough sign lettered in it in what looked like charcoal said, stock boarded 20 cents the night. <laughs> and that's all misspelled, right? Stock boarded 20 cents. It should be C-E-N-T-S the night. N-I-G-H-T is what it should be. Pretty funny. Francis doubted that the board included anything like feet or grass in this strip lane. He raised his eyes and squinted and through gusts in the blowing dirt he saw a series of small shacks arranged on the other side of the crown. Like the boarding pen, 
They were made from old wagon parts gleaned from wreckage on the trail. It looked more like a junkyard for old wagons than anything else. And it also looked deserted. He peered inside the huts as best he could, but couldn't see anything for a full minute and a half. Then a tarped curtain over one of the openings, it couldn't be called a door, was pushed back and a face showed for a moment, then disappeared and reappeared a moment later with a hat on. A thin man, tall and sunken, with a dark beard, trimmed short and pointed on the end, came out of the hut and approached Francis. He put one hand on the mare's bridle and she pulled her head away and wiggled her ears, a sign of nervousness. <coughs> You'll be wanting to board the animals, he spoke in a low voice, almost a hiss. And Francis suddenly thought of snakes and court wire in that order. Near the huts, the wind had died, and Francis could see better. He shook his head. I don't have any money, but I need a home for the young ones. I found them in a deserted wagon on the prairie. I think their father was killed by a bear. A white lie can't hurt, he thought. Is there room for them here? Cholera, you mean, the man, man smiled shrewdly and inspected Lottie and Billy more closely. Don't make no never mind to me. I've had it, and so's my missus. Once you've had it, you can't take it again. He pushed the tarp back and looked at Billy and Lottie more closely, pinched their arms. They don't look sickly. Peers, they could pull their own weight anyways. Good, I'll take them. He lifted them off the mule and carried them into the hut without another word, and Francis sat feeling uncomfortable. On the one hand, he wanted a home for them, but the man was was wrong somehow. He shrugged the feeling off and dismounted. They should have a better chance here, and maybe a train would come along after the one that shunned them that wouldn't mind taking them on. They would be better off, he thought again, but he tried the mayor. He tied the mayor to the corral fence and made his way to the hut to lift the tarp sideways and peer inside. The man was there, doing something with a bucket and a water barrel, his back to the opening. There was also a woman, the man's wife, and, the, and she was as thin as the man, had the same angular look about her, a sunken, hungry look. But she had Billy in her lap and was pinching Lottie's cheek and smiling, and Francis dropped the tart back and returned to the horse. It would be all right. They'd be safer here than trying to ride with Francis. The man came out of the hut with a bucket of water. Your stock will need water, he said. Thank you. It's four cents, the bucket, he said quickly. You got four cents. Francis stared at the man. Four cents for a bucket of water? And he shook his head. No, I don't have any money. You got something to trade? For four cents? For the water. I need some supplies and I've got two rifles to trade. He thought suddenly of a pistol and added, and I've got a pistol as well, but it belongs to the children. I'll take it for him, he said. And you know, keep it for them. What supplies you need? Flour and sugar and some bacon. How many rifles did you say? Two. You don't know the prices here, do you? Nope. A rifle will bring you flour or sugar or bacon. Not all of them, just one of them. Ten pounds of flour, five pounds of sugar, five pounds of bacon. For a rifle? Uh, yep. What do you want? Francis took his head, shook his head. It was Robert, but he had no need for Dub's rifle, and he did need flour. Flour, one rifle's worth. And you throw in that bucket of water for the mare and the mule. Would you be looking for getting a shed of that mule? It seems about to die on you. Francis looked at the mule and thought how much better it looked now than it had when he first saw it and smiled. That mule will still be going when you're done, mister. He stays with me. Just as you say. I can work for you, Francis said, to pay off other supplies. Don't need it now. Well, then, that's it. The man went back in to one of the huts while Francis watered the mule and mare, and he came out in a couple of minutes carrying a cloth feed sack with 10 pounds of flour and handed it to Francis to tie on his saddle. Francis handed him Dub's rifle and mounted the mare and took the lead rope from the mule and rode off into the dust without looking back, forcing himself to not look back. Whew. Man, I don't know I could have left the kids. But there you go. That's it. One more chapter, hopefully tomorrow.